Well, let's give it another minute or two and then we can start. And if people join late, we'll get them in when they get here. The dog has the loudest bone in history. Lori, why don't we go ahead and start? And then if people okay. join us late, they join. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Good morning and thank you for joining the Ohio Chapter American Academy of Pediatrics webinar focusing on juvenile idiopathic arthritis. This webinar will be recorded and housed on the Ohio AAP website. Following this webinar, we will be sending the link to the recording along with instructions on how to obtain your CME. Please mute your line so that we do not have any interruptions for the recording. Please use the chat feature to ask any questions or provide comments throughout the presentation. You may also go off mute at the end of the formal presentation to ask any questions. Our speakers today are Dr. Chris Peltier and Dr. Jennifer Huggins. Dr. Peltier is a pediatrician in an independent community practice. He also is an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and serves as the director of the community section in the Division of General and Community Pediatrics at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. His main academic interest is in medical education. He precepts medical students and residents in his office. He has presented numerous faculty development workshops, both regionally and nationally, as well as leading education and quality improvement projects through the Ohio AAP. Dr. Huggins is the fellowship program director in the Division of Rheumatology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital and is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Cincinnati. Before she became a rheumatologist, Dr. Huggins worked as a primary care pediatrician. She completed a fellowship in allergy, immunology, and rheumatology because she wanted to focus more on immunology. Dr. Huggins has a special interest in caring for patients with complex medical needs. She is passionate about patient care and strives to be thorough in the care she provides. Thank you both for joining us today. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Peltier. Thanks, Laura. If you want to go ahead and do the next slide. Um, so welcome, everybody. I know it's a crazy busy time. Um, we're all feeling it. So I want to thank all of you for taking an hour um, to sort of join us this morning. And a, a special thank you to Dr. Huggins for being our content expert um, for this series. Um, and as we're actually um, going to talk about at the end, this is actually the first in a series of four webinars that we are, that the Ohio chapter is doing on um, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And then we also have some other educational opportunities that we're going to present at the end. So our learning objectives for this morning are we're going to review the common history and physical exam findings in JIA. We're going to compare and contrast the different types of JIA. And then finally, we're going to, Dr. Huggins is going to help us differentiate inflammatory arthritis from arthritis from infectious causes. Next slide, Lori. So next slide, please. So there was, um, when the email went out with the um, registration link, we had asked you um, to uh, go to a, a website and, and type in a short word or a phrase um, of when you think about juvenile idiopathic arthritis, what comes to mind. So if we could show those. Um, so I we thought this was just sort of a nice exercise. Normally, I'd probably do this if we were in person and I would we would just sort of, you know, have people shout out. But um, th this was a nice way to do this. And so this kind of gives us some of the things that hopefully we're going to um, cover during this series of webinars. So, you know, obviously disbelief, I love that that's in the middle, right? How can my child have this? And, and what does this mean? I can't believe this is happening. You know, I think we see pain, inflammation a couple of times, children, right? So this is obviously, um, you know, a chronic disease that affects our kids and, and the impact that it has. And we're going to talk a little bit in future sessions about maybe some of the psychological effects that, that this chronic disorder has side effects, right? So unfortunately, as we get into some of this, Dr. Huggins is going to let us know that, that while some of the medicines, you know, definitely can help treat our patients with GIA, that they do not come without some um, risk as well. 
Next slide. And one more. There we go. So I'm going to just kind of start out again. As Lori said, I'm a general pediatrician. So, you know, I, I really, um, when, when Dr. Huggins and I put this together, really wanted to focus on sort of how kids are going to present to us as primary care pediatricians. So just kind of as an overview, this is really things that, that we as primary care pediatricians and providers should be looking for. So just a brief review that juvenile idiopathic arthritis is not a single disease. And it really is a diagnosis of exclusion that includes all forms of childhood chronic arthritis of an unknown cause. We're gonna see patients typically with symptoms prior to the age of 16 years. And to make a diagnosis, symptoms really have to be present for more than six weeks. Next slide. It is the most common chronic um, rheumatologic disorder in children. Incidence is about one in a thousand. And as, as you know, and from that word cloud, it does result, unfortunately, in both short and long-term disability. And again, these are kids that, that most of the time, they're not gonna be going to a rheumatologist when they first present. We're gonna be seeing them in our office. And, and, and that's why really history and physical exam is so many things in medicine is really key to recognizing this and making the diagnosis. Next slide. So just some pearls of uh, things to, to look at when you're taking a history that you may think, could this child maybe have GIA? So joint stiffness is going to be the most specific symptom, and Dr. Huggins is going to talk a little bit more about that. So kids may present um, with joint stiffness that worsens after they've been sleeping or sitting for long periods. Most commonly, they're going to complain of this happening in the morning, and as their day goes on and they increase their activity, that joint stiffness improves. Not only is there, there joint stiffness, but there is persistent joint swelling. There may be pain often, but it's usually not severe. And, and I, I think this is really important to remember that the JIA is most unlikely if a patient only presents with joint pain and no stiffness, swelling, or limitations in activity. Next slide. So moving on to just again, and, and Dr. Huggins is going to talk more about specific physical exam findings um, when she sees our kids in clinic for referral, but you're really looking for signs of acute arthritis, joint effusion and swelling, warmth to the joint, decreased range of motion, and then of course pain with, with either uh, you know, palpating that joint or, or inducing range of motion. It's important to note that in chronic arthritis that the joints are usually not painful, however. Next slide. So I'm gonna kind of um, tag team with Dr. Huggins for the rest of this presentation. I'm gonna present some cases and then I'm gonna let Dr. Huggins sort of go through um, from a, a rheumatologic expert um, sort of opinion. So this is a two-year-old female who presents in your office with a swollen left knee and has a limp. Her parents noticed the swollen knee began after a fall, although they really were surprised because they really felt this was a minor injury. And thinking back, they wonder if maybe she was limping slightly before the accident, but her gait really seems much worse lately. She does not complain of pain, but she does seem stiff in the morning for a couple of hours over the last two weeks. Next slide. On physical exam, you find that her left knee is swollen. She does have some synovial hypertrophy and a small fluid wave is seen. And she actually has difficulty strengthening or straightening that leg. You do notice some leg length discrepancy and all of her other joints are normal. You do some basic lab work, including an ANA, and that comes back positive. At this point, I'm thinking I need to refer to my colleague, Dr. Huggins. And so I'm gonna ask her to sort of jump in and, and kind of help me out with this patient. Next slide, Dr. Huggins. So um, this <clears throat> child represents someone with um, oligoarticular JIA, sorry about the raspy voice. <clears throat> um, and what that means is it's less than or equal to four joints. So can we go to the next slide please? So um, this is um, typically the child that you'll see with this uh, is a kid, you know, between 18 months and three years of age. Um, does usually present with a history of falling because kids in this age range fall. Um, and that's okay because, um, you know, I did have the privilege of doing 12 years of primary care. And if you think of JIA with every kid that's fallen, you're going to miss the most common things that happen. But um, over time, they will start to walk with the limp. 
Uh, and probably the most important thing to know about this group is that this group, especially if the ANA is positive, is most likely to have the eye disease associated with JIA. And so if, if you're having trouble getting a child in to see rheumatology, get them into the eye doctor if you suspect this. <clears throat> um, next slide, please. Um, and typically, um, it presents in the knee, can be the wrist, can be the ankle, can be the elbow. Um, but interestingly, <clears throat> as opposed to in the adult world, um, you can see uh, the left leg of both of these children, uh, the knee is swollen. And you can see the little boy on the left, um, his left leg is longer than the right. And um, that happens because in the joint that has the arthritis, it gets more blood flow and hence that leg grows longer. Once we get the arthritis under control, um, then that equals out. Um, and the reason they walk with a limp, one is because the leg is longer, but that takes some time to develop. The other is that these kids are running around with running funny, but they're running around not really complaining of much pain, just limping because there's not enough room for all the fluid and for them to walk on it. Um, next slide again, please. Yep, so that's the next case. So I think that Take home messages are not, not a lot of pain, a funny gait. And um, you know, if you get blood work, that's fine, but don't uh, make your assessment based on any blood work because all the blood work can be normal and the kid can have rip roaring arthritis. So if you're concerned, you know, send them to us because we spend a lot of extra time learning how to examine joints in little people and also think of the eye doctor if you think it's gonna take a while to get them into us. So Jennifer, would you recommend that every patient that's diagnosed with, with oligarticular JIA see an eye doctor then? Oh, so we have a schedule and every kid with JIA period Perfect. gets to the eye doctor. So once we get a hold of them, uh, that happens, and, you know, and the eye right. people are just a couple of floors up from us. But yeah, but uh, and in this area, hopefully it's not a real long wait to get them to us, but it, and then we'll take care of it. But if it, if it is, the most important thing is to make sure they don't have eye disease. And there was a comment in, from one of our participants that, that um, she actually has a daughter with oligarticular J and it actually involves her jaw. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Um, the jaw is trickier. So I'm sorry that she has the jaw. We can still uh, get that under control, but there is sometimes, but not always pain involved in that. But we go to work quickly on a jaw because um, you can't, in the knee, we can get better without any issues, but the jaw, we got to get to work before there's any joint destruction, because otherwise when they're old like me, they're going to have a lot of pain and discomfort. So um, yeah, hopefully they're getting good aggressive treatment. Oh, that's very unfortunate about the jaw replacement. Yeah, sorry about that, Teresa. Goodness. All right, our next case um, is a four-year-old little girl who presents with decreased activity and increased irritability. You find out that she's been eating less and that when you measure her height and compare it to previous visits, it really hasn't been unchanged for several months. She is very slow to move in the morning and after she takes a nap, she's also having trouble using a fork or spoon to feed herself. Next slide. On physical exam, you see swelling of her bilateral wrists, elbows, multiple MCP joints, as well as a couple of PIP joints. Again, you do some lab evaluation. She has a normal CBC, an elevated SED rate, her rheumatoid factor is negative, and her ANA comes back at a, a one to a 160. Next slide. And I'm gonna let Dr. Huggins kind of lead us through polyarticular JIA. So polyarticular just means more than five joints. Um, and again, um, the, we do a rheumatoid factor on all of these kids, but um, there's an, only a handful of kids that actually have a positive rheumatoid factor and behave like the adults with rheumatoid arthritis. And that's typically teenage girls that for all intents and purposes really have RA that are RF positive. So please, please don't rely on blood work. Um, you know, in rheumatology, it's taking multiple pieces of a puzzle and see if they fit. And, uh, you know, 
we are privileged enough to get extra training and looking at joints. So if you're worried, you, you can get blood work if you want, but we never mind looking at joints um, to see because we have had many, many kids that because the blood work was normal, they were delayed in getting to us. A delayed in getting to us because you're thinking of the more common things is very appropriate. And uh, believe me, I know that the challenges of being a primary care doctor, it, it's, it's the most difficult position to be in, but um, just know that rheumatoid vector negative doesn't really help you that much in this group. Um, next slide, please. And um, it is sometimes a symmetric arthritis, but that's more so if it really looks like the adults with rheumatoid arthritis, but you can see in the PIP joints, um, I don't think you can see my arrow, but it, it's, um, the, they're quite swollen. Um, and one um, simple way, I don't know if you can see my video, but because in primary care, you don't have time to look at every single joint of the hand, but one simple way to do it is ask them to make a fist, but not like this, because they can cover up a lot of stuff, but like this. And if they can't get their fingers all the way back, send them to us. The other thing is that the wrists are frequently involved in poly J and instead of using their hands where they push down to get on the table, they'll do this. So any kind of funny movement in the hands, you don't have to look at every joint. You don't have time to look at every joint. The, those can be some good signs to, to just send them to rheumatology. Next slide, please. Yeah. Jennifer, can I ask you a question about rheumatoid factor? Because yeah. back when I was a resident and, and Sue Boyer in Indiana trained me, kind of told me, taught me to never get a, a rheumatoid factor to sort of let the rheumatologist do that. Would you recommend primary care providers get an RF or just wait until and let you do that? Um, I think we're okay either way. You know, we oftentimes need additional blood work, like to get certain medications that we're going to use approved, things like that. So we're okay, at least. I'm okay if they come without blood work. If you're getting blood work, go ahead and get it. Just don't rely on that as a reason to send them to us. If, you know, again, we're in a privileged spot. So if you're suspicious, just, you know, we're, we're always happy if they don't have arthritis. Um, and we're always happy if we get them early if they do, because we can get it under control quicker. And I think that was her point, just to get it. And then if it's negative, not necessarily that that may mean that they don't yeah. have, have JI. So great. All right. Our next case, now you're now seeing a three-year-old girl who was hospitalized for one month of fever and sort of the infectious disease workup has been negative to date. You get a history that she has fevers in the early morning and late in the afternoon. And when she's febrile, the parents report that she gets a rash that's red on her trunk, her arms, and her inner thighs. And when the fever goes away, so does the rash. And she has difficulty breathing when she lies flat. Next slide. On physical exam in your office, she has a fever to 102 and she's tachycardic and she's a little bit fussy. It looks like she doesn't feel good. Her skin exam shows small, slightly raised pink macules on her trunk and arms. And you note that her knees, ankles, and wrists are also swollen bilaterally. Um, you order an echocardiogram based on her history of difficulty breathing when she lays down and you find that she has a moderate pericardial effusion. Next slide. And, uh, and here's just some physical exam findings that, that sort of what you see, that rash doesn't show up very well, but you can see multiple joints with arthritis. Next slide. So I'm going to ask Dr. Huggins to, to sort of lead us through systemic or systemic onset juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Jennifer. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. So um, parents of children that have SJ are very frustrated that this even falls in the category of JA because um, it really is a different disease. So um, they, they have arthritis sometimes, but you don't really look for arthritis, but they are systemically quite ill. Um, and um, you know maybe someday this is gonna be a category in and of itself, but they start out sometimes with you know daily like constant fevers, but eventually they go on to develop a fever that just occurs once or twice a day and usually when that fever comes, they have this very evanescent rash as, uh, that has what's called the Kebner phenomenon. So like in the previous picture of that little girl, when someone put their hand on her shoulder, it then made the rash in that location. But sometimes the rash is very hard to find because it comes only when they have a fever and they may have the fever at 
three in the morning or whatever. But these kids are pretty ill. They, they have lymphadenopathy, big liver, big spleen, um, and they can go on to develop serositis, the pleuritis, pericarditis. Um, and this is like all of our diseases, a diagnosis of exclusion, but always we're looking to make sure they don't have, you know, because this can be a presentation of leukemia or lymphoma. Or um, oftentimes we'll get asked, you know, is this atypical Kawasaki's and what they really have is systemic JA. But these kids um, won't be too hard to pick out because they're, they're ill. And actually in our diseases, very few of our diseases really have a fever, uh, but that can be a, you know, a prominent feature of this. And in between the fever, they usually, they don't look normal to the parent, but they usually behave pretty normally. Like you think, oh, this kid's okay. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, uveitis is rare. Again, these kids will have typically an elevated sed rate, CRP. These are the kids that also have a very high ferritin, but the ANA is often negative. Um, it can occur throughout childhood, but we see it in young. I think the youngest kid I had was like four months of age. So we can see it in, in young children as well. And they usually have, you know, pretty high white count, pretty, they, their labs look like Kawasaki's. Um, Next slide, please. And this is the representation of what we call a quotidian fever curve. Once or twice a day, the fever spikes. And when it returns, the red line is the normal line. It'll return below normal. Now, as a primary care physician, seeing these kids for the first time, you're not going to have the value of a fever curve like this. But when we get consulted in the hospital, the first place we look is at the synopsis that gives us a fever curve, because we can get some idea from from the get-go about that, but um, this would not be something that would be handed to you when they walk in the door for sure. All right, next slide, please. And then this is an example of this evanescent rash, meaning it comes and goes, often comes when they have a fever and is gone. Um, and it, it can look like any other rash that you see in primary care. So um, it has to go with the whole picture, but next slide, yeah. Can I ask you a question about um, sort of the fever and, and you know, obviously sort of those fussy, irritable kids with fever and rash, you think, as you said, Kawasaki's obviously malignancies on there. How do these it, sort of differentiating these kids between sort of periodic fever kids? Is it the fact that those periodic fever kids only have fever for like three or four days and then they're fine for months in between? Is that the big distinguishing the fact that they probably don't look as sick when they have the fever? Yeah, it's mostly just the periodicity of the fever. Um, you know, it's become that now that there's genetic testing for those periodic fever syndromes uh, that we get sent every kid with a fever, but you know, those fever syndromes are really, really rare. Yeah. Um, there is still, it was, uh, it, it's a long time ago now, but in 2001 in the New England Journal is a very good review of fever syndromes because it was before we had all, there were some genetic mutations because when we mapped the human genome in 1999, then that's when they started finding genetic associations with these fever syndromes. But that article in the New England Journal, and we can get it to you guys if, if it's important, it still outlines the clinical features of those fever syndromes. And if they don't have some of those clinical manifestations, they probably don't have a fever syndrome. But yeah, that they tend not to be as sick, although the hyper IgD looks a lot like systemic JA. But again, that, that, those kids will be very ill. They typically get very ill after you give them vaccines and things like that. But it it is hard to distinguish them. It's even hard for rheumatology. So, um, but don't look for arthritis in these kids and say it's not SJA because they don't have arthritis because that can be a late manifestation. That's a great point. And I don't think we have a case for psoriatic arthritis. I think I'm just going to let you kind of continue and, and talk okay. about it a little bit. Okay. So this is an interesting one. And again, not uh, only reason to know about this as primary care is if they say, if we say, well, that we think this kid has psoriatic arthritis and you're like, well, this looks like the oligo J kid that I saw, or this looks like a poly J. So the nomenclature is something that you don't need to get too bogged down with. In the adult world, they typically have psoriasis and then some of those people go on to develop psoriatic arthritis. But in our kids, they will frequently present with a swollen knee or 
uh, you know, a swollen wrist. And so we have to look for things like uh, nail pinning or a first degree relative that has psoriasis, or we'll show you a picture in a minute, but if the child has dactylitis, which is the whole digit is swollen, not just the joint, then, uh, then we know that this is psoriatic arthritis, but it could, we could call it psoriatic arthritis if they have these things, even though the kid doesn't have psoriasis yet, because that may happen later. Um, I think that's, those are the most important things about psoriatic arthritis. And then we can show the pictures. Next slide, please. Yeah, so dactylitis, you can see her, um, her index finger is totally swollen, not just the joints, but even the soft tissue. So we call that dactylitis. If you see dactylitis, send them to us because that usually means psoriatic arthritis. Sometimes a child will be kind enough to give us nail pitting as you see on the upper right panel or onchalysis where it looks like they have a fungal and, but this is really psoriasis in the nail. Interestingly, if you have psoriasis in the nail, you frequently have arthritis in the joint adjacent to that. Um, and, or we look for first degree relative that actually has psoriasis. All right. So it's been a busy day of kids complaining with, with joint issues. We now have a 16 year old boy who comes in with a three week history of swelling in his left knee. He also says that, that he's had some pain on the bottom of his feet for several years, but that it is getting worse. And when you're sort of asking any recent illnesses, the parents tell you that he's had multiple episodes of, of pink eye over the last several weeks. Next slide. Physical exam does show indeed a left swollen knee with synovial hypertrophy and a fluid wave. He has pain at the plantar fascia on the calcaneus, as well as the metatarsal heads. And his lab evaluation shows that he is ANA negative, rheumatoid factor negative, but HLA B27 positive. Next slide. I'm gonna ask Dr. Huggins to, to walk us through and thesis related JIA. So I think the main reason for you guys to um, be familiar with this category is because um, this is actually a very confusing category, even for rheumatologists, but um, there can be some clues for the enthesitis related JIA that will present to you first. So for instance, um, they frequently will have eye inflammation that's very different from the eye involvement that occurs in our other kids with JIA. Because our other kids with JIA, when they get anterior uveitis, it's um, asymptomatic. But in the enthesitis related, they will come to you with a red painful eye. And a, an isolated red painful eye should go to the eye doctor because pink eye is never in one eye or rarely in one eye because it's so contagious that both are. So if you ever have an isolated red painful eyes, send them to the eye doctor because that can be the first clue of this category. Um, the other clue to this category that you guys will see before, long before us is if you, if they are like, for instance, presenting with knee pain, but the area of inflammation is not at the location that you're used to seeing for Osgood slaughters, but you see an inflamed tendon because that's what the emphasis is where the tendon attaches to the bone. So if you see it, well, this is this looks like Osgood slaughter, but it's not the right location for Osgood slaughter, or you know, they have a hugely swollen tendon in their elbow um, at the insertion site, then that might be a reason to say, hmm, I wonder if rheumatology should look look at this person. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so I think these details you can have, but this is more detail than you, you need because the enthesitis related category really encompasses um, a kid that comes with an isolated knee that's swollen and they're older than eight. And they've had some of these other things that I've described to you that you would have seen early on. Also, the kids with juvenile ankylosing spondylitis fall in this category. Some of the psoriatic arthritis fall in this category, and some of the kids with arthritis associated with IBD fall in this category. So 
all of this detail is good for you to have as a reference, but I am telling you the points that would be useful for you to know. And then I think the other thing that was pointed out in the case was um, this is a situation where the kids do, if it's involving the entheses or the plantar fascia, they have a lot of pain. So some of these kids really have trouble even like standing on their foot in the shower or something like that. Or if the, uh, the subtarsal area of the foot and ankle is involved, that area doesn't have enough room for extra fluid and it's, it's exquisitely painful. So this would be one example of, um, of where the kid would be older, eight or older usually, but they will have a significant amount of pain. So I think the three things that you would be alerted to would be, if you see inflammation at an emphasis that doesn't fit with your common, like Seavers is another common thing. So if, you're, if they're not responding to your usual treatment of Seavers, then think of us, but still do your usual thing first, unless they've had like recurrent red eye or, or other funny emphases related um, you know, injuries. Next would slide. you recommend the same thing for a kid with back pain that you, you might be worried about? Uh, you know, obviously you're doing, uh, you know, uh, and said you're sending them to physical therapy if they're not getting better. Start to think about maybe ankylosis spondylitis and. Yeah. So the the thing about ankylosis spondylitis is that usually in kids presents with peripheral joint disease. And I have, you know, having done years of primary care, even in kids, back pain is so common. Back pain in kids right. is usually too tight of hamstrings. Right. So it's rare for us to see a kid, maybe an older teenage boy will start with some uh, sacral ileitis, but that is really rare for us to see. So um, compared to the number of kids that we get sent with back pain, because the back is very rarely involved in our or things. So do your usual back pain thing. And then if they're not getting better, or if there's a family history of ankylosing spondylitis, then by all means, even if we say it's from too tight of hamstrings, it's our job to follow those people along. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I think these are just some common things. I think we spoke about most of them. So next slide, because there's a lot of these. Yeah. Um, yeah, these are just uh, some of the common sites that you can see the emphases. Uh, um, sorry, my self, my phone is going off in the background. Um, these are the common sites. We talked about the tibial tuberosity. The Achilles tendon is the largest tendon, so inflammation at that site can happen. A plantar fascia is another co common thing. Anything in the foot, be sure just to send to us. All right, next slide, please. And then this is what we're referring to as an emphasis. It's easiest to show it in the Achilles tendon, which is the largest tendon. You can see on the right, um, it's quite swollen there. Um, and it refers to inflammation at the site where the tendon attaches to the bone. Uh, next, please. And I am wondering, so, um, Here's some more detail about juvenile ankylosing spondylitis. This is extremely rare, most often associated with HLA-B27, but just so you know, HLA-B27 is a very common genetic marker. So just having HLA-B27 as a marker doesn't mean that you're gonna go on to having disease. There's lots of other, uh, um, they, most of them actually don't go on to develop juvenile ankylosing spondylitis. I would say also in a teenager, uh, we're gonna talk about this in just a minute, but if they have sacroiliitis, the most common thing you should think about is do they have inflammatory bowel disease? Because that's a location that the uh, joints can be involved in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and again, the uveitis in this case is an acute red painful eye, not the subtle uh, where you have to look with a slit lamp exam like in our other kids. But I think for sake of time, yeah, this is just an example. Uh, maybe we can go to the next slide. Um, and then I think it's important to know that um, one of the extra intestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease is arthritis. Um, and there's two ways that this can present. One is peripheral joint arthritis and the, this is the most common and the reality is if they have peripheral joint arthritis, 
and it's active, then their inflammatory bowel disease is probably still active. So if the way to treat the peripheral joint disease in IBD is to get the IBD under control. But if they have axial involvement with sacroiliitis, then, um, then they can have very active inflammation in their spine without active inflammatory bowel disease. But those are the two ways that, that it can present. Next slide, please. Yeah, and then you're going to do this, right? Yeah, there. so thank you guys have been um, sort of just kind of listening to us talk. So we're going to try to get you involved a little bit. So um, Lori, do we have the, the polls ready? So I'm going to present this and then we're going to ask you to sort of choose the answer. And then Dr. Huggins is going to go, go through the, the question. So this is a two-year-old female that presents with a swollen left knee that has been present for over six weeks. Her left leg is two centimeters longer than the right. Her ANA is, is positive at one to 320 and she has a negative rheumatoid factor. What would be the most important next step? Should you, um, if you could just choose uh, one, two, three, or four, arthrocentesis for synovial fluid analysis, intraarticular steroid injection, refer to physical therapy for a shoe lift or ophthalmologic slit lamp exam. And I'm gonna give everybody a minute to kind of answer that question. And then we'll see the results. And then we'll let Dr. Huggins kind of tell us what we should have done. Laura, were you able to see the what what everybody thought? Yep. Want me to go ahead and end it? Yep. Go ahead and show what what the results were, and then we'll let Dr. Huggins tell us what the right answer was. All right. Next slide, please. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Huggins. Well, you you guys are excellent listeners. <laughs> so, I hopefully you know. Um, even on your main subscription board exam, this is going to be a like of our just one leg longer than the other. Um, the ANA is positive. You care most about what's going on. Are we going to the next? Yeah, go ahead and move to the next one. You were freezing up a little bit, Jennifer, I oh, think. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, that's okay. Yeah, um, I think this is good for them just for the sake of time. I think it's good to have as a reference, but you're not, you did well in the question and this is just a little more detail about the anterior uveitis, but maybe the next slide is helpful. Just to know that um, we're talking about, you know, this dividing the eye and the yellow portion is the what we call the anterior portion. And actually, um, you don't have time to do this, but in your office, you can look at the anterior portion of the eye by putting the ophthalmoscope at plus 10. And um, it will show you uh, if you know what you're looking for, you know, inflammatory cells, if there's a lot of them there. But the ophthalmologist has a slit lamp, which is just a magnified a view of, of the anterior portion of the eye. And that's the, what they're looking at. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, and then I think, uh, again, we, we briefly talked about um, uh, the, the, if you have arthritis in your knee, that that leg can grow longer. But again, unlike our adults, we also see other areas of growth disturbance. Luckily, because we have newer medications and because we have well-informed primary care doctors, we get these kids earlier than we used to. So the, the film on or the photo on the right where you see that the foot is probably smaller than it should have been because of arthritis in the foot and the one toe is smaller. We don't see that as often, but before our newer medications, we used to see a lot of either, either the limb grows longer or the foot is smaller. Um, and next slide. I think it's, yeah. And then this is one thing that uh, we we try to avoid. So we do a good TMJ exam on every kid with any type of arthritis because they may or may not have symptoms, but you know, this is the most uh, frequently used joint. And um, 
uh, we want to get the arthritis in the TMJ under control before we see this microagnathia or recession of the lower jaw. Next, yeah. And um, as we talked about in the very first slide, JIA is a, is in a diagnosis of exclusion. And so these are some of the things that we, um, you know, are looking for. I would say the category of systemic things are things that are really our responsibility and they will have had a number of clues that, that this is not, uh, you know, something that, that you should be handling by yourself. But um, reactive arthritis, we're gonna go through here for just a minute because actually this is something that you certainly can send to us, but that you will, um, you know, you will encounter and it has much more of a, a different pattern than our kids with JA. So maybe the next slide. So I actually meant for this oh. slide to be before these two slides. These are just, this slide and the next slide are really just summary slides of all of the, the different JIA subtypes that, that Dr. Huggins went over. So, um, and some of the characteristics. So Lori, if you just wanna go through, go to the next slide and then one more, and then we'll jump back into the reactive arthritis. Okay. So actually, yeah, right. gonna set you up right. with the case. Thank yeah, I, that was my fault for putting that out of order. I'm sorry. Um, so, so this is a three-year-old boy in your office who comes in with a two days, a fever, limp, and a red and swollen left knee, right? So I think that's the key, right? A little different than we see lots of times those three-year-olds that have fever and limp, and it turns out to be very mild toxic synovitis, but this kid has a red and swollen left knee, right? So no history of recent trauma or illness. He's febrile to 39. And on physical exam, he's got a warm, erythematous, tender left knee with a limited range of motion and an effusion. All right, so we're going to pull up a next poll question. What would be the most important next step? Would you get an MRI of his knee, an x-ray of his knee? Would you um, do a diagnostic evaluation of joint fluid from that knee? Or would you just send him home on non-steroidals and, and follow up? So go ahead and, and answer those questions. And then we'll, we'll let Dr. Huggins kind of walk us through what the right answer was. And then Lori, whenever you kind of get some, you know, if you, when, when everybody's answered, if you want to put that poll up and then we can advance the slide and see how we did. So we got a mix. So we have some people that wanted to do an MRI and some people wanted to do um, joint fluid evaluation. Jennifer, what, what, what should we have done? Well, I can understand why both were chosen because um, in the primary care setting, it's gonna be hard for you to do the joint fluid analysis, but this kid probably has a infected joint and uh, you, you need to look at the fluid to know so. So our kids with JA, especially oligo JA, they're not gonna have a fever. Um, and the the joint will be inflamed if it's J and the knee will be warmer than the leg above and below. But these knees are, and the infected kids are red hot. Um, and uh, infection is, a, is something that you guys do very well anyway, ruling out, <clears throat> which is more common than J and more uh, destructive. So if they actually have you know, uh, infected knee, you're, you're going to want to figure that out sooner rather than later um, because you don't want the joint to be destroyed. Uh, but it's, but you can order an MRI as a primary care doctor. It's going to be harder for you to just get joint fluid, but this would be someone to send to the ER uh, to, to get evaluated. Um, but so I can see why people picked MRI. Um, and then this is just, um, again, this would not be for you guys to have to figure out, but um, this is just a distinction. Maybe it's useful for you to review before you're taking an exam, but um, the white count will be elevated in JIA, but it'll be markedly elevated if it's truly a septic joint. Um, otherwise, the, you know, the viscosity is low, meaning normal joint fluid is like, um, oil in your car or your lawnmower and inflamed joint fluid is more like water it'll still be a little bit sticky but but the once you get some inflammation whether it's from ja or a septic joint it's going to be the viscosity is going to be low um, so we would choose to look at the joint fluid um, 
but you will have to refer them to the ER or ortho or us to get that done. Yeah. Next slide. So I think you guys are pretty good at knowing when the joint is septic. Um, reactive arthritis and post-infectious arthritis are a little more tricky, but the take-home messages for that is that those joints, it's rarely, uh, it's more of a migratory arthritis. So one day it might be that the elbow is really painful and the next day it might be that the knee is really painful or you might have a couple of joints and they're really, really painful. Um, I think next slide. Um, these are some of the more common infections, but you know, uh, you don't have to, if, you, if they had a recent parvo infection and they're having a lot of joint symptoms, then you can be probably assured that it's reactive, but you don't, you're not always given the, you know, the particular virus or infection that might be causing this prior to when they have the arthritis. But again, it's more migratory. It responds very well to non-steroidals um, and it's self-limited. So next slide. And then it's very confusing, the literature. So what we call reactive arthritis now, because Ryder was not a very good person. So there is this triad of arthritis, conjunctivitis, and urethritis that's you know, um, precipitated by chlamydia, salmonella, Yersinia, shigella, something we learned in medical school. We now also call that reactive arthritis uh, instead of Ryder syndrome, but, um, but it's, um, in this particular case, it's just reactive arthritis uh, secondary to one of these infections. And uh, some of these infections, you know, get treated with antibiotics and some do not, but always for the arthritis, uh, you know, naproxen uh, is, is our standard treatment. Next slide. And then this is one that we see more and more and would really probably present to you first. Um, and that is Lyme arthritis. And it has, <clears throat> um, it has very characteristic feature in that it is a hugely swollen, very warm uh, knee usually. It can be other joints, but knee. And actually they don't have a whole bunch of pain, but it's like, you know, soccer ball size swelling. And it's important to remember that, the, that arthritis associated with Lyme is a late manifestation so you may not be given, uh, you know, the history of a tick or or the classic rash of erythema migrans. Um, but, but polyarticular involvement of small joints is rare. But I think the next slide shows you a picture of yeah. You can just see that the knee is huge. And then the other thing about this is like it might be this big, and three days later it might be back to a normal size. So. Um, and so sometimes they show you this picture and you're like, oh, I know what this is because it may not look like that when you see it, but unless you have a history of trauma or something like that, it's Lyme titers are appropriate. Um, next slide, yeah. All right, so we have one more case this morning. Um, this is a 10 year old boy who comes into your, your office with substernal chest pain and feeling lightheaded when he stands is a three week history of fever up to 39 twice a day that he gets with, when he has a fever, he also has a rash. On exam, you note that he has enlargement of his liver and spleen. He's got generalized lymphadenopathy and arthritis in his knees, ankles, and his wrists. After going through this talk, you, dis, you suspect a diagnosis of systemic GIA. What is the most likely cause of his chest pain? Is it pneumonia, costochondritis, viral myocarditis or pericarditis with effusion. And we'll throw up the poll one more time and this will be the last one we do today. So if you would just sort of say what you think the, the most likely explanation for his chest pain is, and we'll give you a, a few seconds and we'll post the poll and see what the right answer is. All right, Laurie, we could probably so have definitely involvement of the heart. So I think we, we all agree that there's some heart involvement it seems to be split between, is this a viral myocarditis or is this pericarditis with effusion? Jennifer, what's going on here? If you would do the next slide. Yeah, I, um, 
this case is supposed to be representing a child with systemic JA and the serositis is part of that, including, you know, a large pericardial fusion. Um, I could see why you would, yeah, because the kid has a fever and some sort of an infection. So viral myocarditis is something that you guys probably see more than yep. a pericardial fusion of systemic JA. So again, I can see, you know, why you would choose that, but the case was to represent just a kid with systemic J and probably where this would be the most confusing wouldn't be so much between viral myocarditis and this, but um, another clue when they're doing echoes to evaluate for Kawasaki's disease, um, you can get a pericardial effusion with Kawasaki's disease, but if you see a pericardial effusion in a kid that seems like they may have Kawasaki's systemic J, you know, remains on the uh, differential. Um. And I think the key point there is, again, as you said, you know, I, I, everybody sensed that, you know, sort of correctly knew that it, it involved the heart. And, and I don't think anybody would fault you for in your office trying to f differentiate between a viral myocarditis and a pericarditis, right? This is not a kid with costochondritis that you're going to send home with ibuprofen and say, let me know if things don't get better, right? right. All right, next slide, please. Um, so we're going to kind of wrap up. That was sort of a whirlwind through sort of differentiating, looking at juvenile idiopathic arthritis, sort of looking at the different subtypes, and then finally kind of looking at some of the other things in that differential, including infectious arthritis. Um, I want to thank all of you for um, being with us this morning. And there are our emails. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. We've got a couple of minutes. Um, and there's our emails. And again, you'll be getting a follow-up email from the chapter with um, a link to the recording as well as the slides. If at any time you have questions, please um, you know, reach out to uh, myself or Dr. Huggins. Next slide, Lori. And then I wanted to... Um, just sort of let you know about some future presentations. Um, our, our next presentation in the series is gonna be October 14th. Um, and that's also gonna be in the morning. And that's mainly gonna focus on a little bit more of a deeper dive on physical examination of joints from Dr. Huggins. And then we have some other um, sessions early in 2022 that'll be in the noon hour, including a multidisciplinary panel looking at, at, at maybe some of the mental health implications and sort of how to help kids deal with chronic pain. Next slide, Lori. And then another educational opportunity and a chance for you to sort of become more comfortable with, with JIA is a, a online journal club um, for which you can receive up to 20 points of MOC part two credit. And we will be sending you all out information um, uh, in regards to that too. And, and Dr. Huggins has selected a couple of, of good articles to kind of begin that journal club. And we'll continue to do those over the next um, coming months. Jennifer, any sort of last comments? Um, there's a couple of references for people. And again, there'll be a reference in the, the journal club, but I'll just sort of let, if, if Jennifer, you have any sort of last comments and then we'll um, wrap it up. No, I just appreciate the dedication of primary care to join us this morning. I know it's crazy busy time. And so do reach out if we can ever be of any help. You can use my email or you know um, call the office and ask for me, whatever. I'm, always happy to um, to help in any way. And I will say, please reach out to us if you have thoughts on topics for these upcoming um, webinars in early 2022. They are not necessarily completely set in stone yet. So we want to make this, um, you know, as meaningful for you all. So if you have suggestions on things you would like, um, please reach out to us. And with that, I'll let everybody get on with their day. Hang in there, everybody. Stay safe. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks for joining us.